plaisir surtout de vous accueillir ici pour la leçon inaugurale du professeur Yves Benoît. C'est une tradition dans notre école de faire une leçon inaugurale lorsqu'un professeur est nommé, euh, professeur euh, euh, associé, full professor, ou qu'il est promu à ce, ce niveau-là, il doit présenter une leçon inaugurale pour se présenter finalement à ses collègues, à, au public, euh, dire ce qu'il fait. C'est ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui avec le professeur Benoît. Avant de donner la parole à Yves, j'aimerais euh, vous euh, présenter, en fait. Donc, Yves Benoît a obtenu son Master et Bachelor à l'Université Pierre et Marie Curie en France, en 1994. Ensuite, il a décidé de venir euh, rejoindre l'EPFL. C'est là qu'on a fait la connaissance pour la première fois de Yves pour faire un PhD avec le professeur Clavel que j'ai vu, je vous le voilà. Euh, il a obtenu son PhD en microengineering, en microtechnique en 2000. Il a ensuite quitté l'école pour être un research scientist au Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute à New York aux US, où il est devenu ensuite assistant, professeur assistant. Euh, de 2005 à 2011 et enfin professeur, euh, euh, non, professeur assistant jusqu'en 2011. Euh, ensuite, il a décidé de revenir en Europe et il a rejoint en fait euh, l'université de Eindhoven en Hollande où il est euh, nommé professeur associé et il est resté là de 2011 à 2014, date à laquelle euh, il nous a rejoint euh, et donc il nous a rejoint depuis maintenant un peu plus d'une année. Je dois encore rajouter que le professeur Yves Belloir est le titulaire de la chaire Richemont et je profite de l'occasion d'ailleurs de remercier en fait le groupe Richemont pour leur, leur contribution pour finalement mettre sur pied cette chaire. Donc un grand merci à la chaire Richemont pour cela. Voilà, je crois que j'ai tout dit et je passe la parole à Yves pour qu'il nous présente ses activités. Je crois qu'on va changer de... Non. Alors, bienvenue, c'est un vrai plaisir que de vous voir tous ici. Je dis quelques mots en français, ensuite je vais passer en anglais. Donc, euh, Christian suggérait peut-être de commencer par l'apéritif. Je trouve que c'est une excellente idée, vu que comme il fait chaud, mais j'espère que quand même vous serez intéressé, intéressé à, à rester un, un petit moment où j'aimerais vous faire partager euh, mes activités de recherche et les, les sujets qui m'intéressent. Alors, heureusement, l'amphithéâtre est climatisé. Voilà, so now I'll switch in, in English so that uh, everybody can uh, understand uh, what, uh, what this is all about. So, well, I'll start with this kind of uh, mysterious title, which is Theory Materials, Properties Locally at Will, Fulfilling an Old Dream. So I'd like to maybe hopefully entertain you for the next uh, half an hour or so uh, about what this is all about and basically uh, why that could be an interesting uh, uh, topic for maybe manufacturing. So maybe let me just start about uh, saying a few words about microengineering and microfabrications. So well, you probably are aware, but they are, it's amazing because now microsystems and microfabricated parts are nearly everywhere. So just an example, but this is the, the, the very projector who is actually showing these slides that's itself containing some key components, and in these key components you have these, sorry, you have these uh, kind of uh, flipping mirrors, uh, thousands of them, which are creating the, the image you're actually seeing at the moment. So, but, you know, maybe you drove to come here, and if you look in a car, it's now full of lots of sophisticated sensors and, and actually mechanical devices and so on. So it's full of microengineering parts, all these requiring some uh, microfabrications. And it's not only affecting technology, it's affecting a lot of different fields, including uh, medical devices. I hope you don't have this kind of problems, but typically this has been a revolution in treating uh, uh, cancer, uh, coronary problems in cancer, in, sorry, in uh, coronary disease. Uh, those are stents. Those are little tubes that are manufactured by laser, for instance. And this is thanks to the progress in miniaturizations. Um, and we can continue on and on and on. There are so many devices now surrounding you, but it's becoming almost ubiquitous is that uh, we don't even see them anymore. For instance, in your key, of, uh, in, in your cars, maybe you don't even know, but there are, are some transponder in there. So it's everywhere. 
and this is thanks to the progress we have made in, uh, in manufacturing. Um, and of course also in a luxury product, like for instance uh, this uh, prototype from Cartier. Um, but one point I'd like to emphasize is that uh, manufacturing is a key enabler for innovations. And I'll just take an example. Uh, well, you know, the idea of guiding light is in fact pretty old. And the first uh, demonstration that you could guide light in a sort of light pipe was made with just uh, some water and a water fountain, just to demonstrate that if you inject the light properly, then it will follow the, the stream of water. And of course, this has led, but a century later, to the, uh, you know, these uh, mass products, so the optical fibers. And uh, that has been possible because of the inventions of these manufacturing techniques, you know, these large uh, columns for drawing uh, optical fibers out of silica. So this has really enabled this uh, kind of mass products. And actually, even now, you, you know, we have, uh, there's a research group at TPFL, of Professor Sorin, who is working into variations of that principle, manufacturing principle, to invent new devices. So really, manufacturing is an enabler. Now, I'll just show you another example. It's a bit more funny, OK? Uh, we all know about airbags. So there are all kinds of legends where the airbags come from, who had the ID first. But it's an old concept, so here I just put a, a cartoon from a, a famous cartoon from Gaston Lagarde. But anyway, from the ID to the product, of course, uh, well, you can have the ID. Well, that would be nice to have such a device. But to make it working, you need to have uh, uh, some key components, and which has enabled uh, airbags has been the progress made in microsystems so that we could miniaturize accelerometers so that it would respond fast enough for airbags to be efficient. So it's another example on how manufacturing is enabling inventions. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm very fond of prehistory, so I just put that example. Uh, just a, a, a bit of a key question, in fact, when we think, uh, think about uh, manufacturing and IDs and products, it's always a question what comes first, in a way. So one could ask, OK, is it uh, when these uh, people, you know, you know, just think about the date, by the way, 25,000 years ago. Huh? So it's uh, enormous. And this is, looks big because I'm, I put a magnified image, but in fact, it's the size of your thumb. OK, so that gives you an idea of uh, how precise, I mean, in a way, it was done already uh, so much, uh, so many years ago. But now, OK. Um, well, one could ask, okay, maybe they have the tool and then they come to that ID, or you could turn it around and say maybe this is, they wanted to make this, and then they think about the tools. Well, we will never know, of course, but obviously in that process of, of uh, designing and, and uh, uh, making devices or product or, or parts, there's always uh, a kind of exchanges between the manufacturing and the part at the end. So it's never uh, only one way, obviously. So we, we develop new process to make something particular, but then those new process may, in turn, uh, open new uh, inventions as well. So can we think about what could be innovations in uh, micro-manufacturing? Um, and then, uh, well, these are typical uh, uh, manufacturing products, uh, microsystem in this case, but what you typically see is that the way we, we design things nowadays is uh, always by combining materials, you know, putting them together, whether it's through uh, MEMS processes, lithographic processes, whether it's through assembly. That's typically how we make things these days. Now, this works fine, and uh, you have uh, all kinds of examples around us, but of course, as we look for increasing, ever increasing the complexity of those devices, then, well, there are always inherently some issues with that. And, and one particular striking thing is that most of those uh, systems are, in a way, uh, two-dimensional or two-dimensional and a half, so not really 3D. So now maybe uh, one could think of, can we think of other approaches? How could we maybe make things different? And then um, another aspect I'd like to point out, maybe you passed by the, our clean room here at EPFL, but there's a kind of a paradox in a way. Uh, we, we, in particular, when we start making nanoscale things, is that, uh, well, we make small things with big things in a way. If you look at uh, what are the infrastructure you need to do those, it's uh, actually quite, uh, quite difficult and qu quite expensive uh, infrastructures. And it's interesting to look in nature because you see those are uh, diatomae, so those are algae, okay? They are made of silica, so th those are glass uh, devices. 
But you see, it's, it's amazing because those are already nano products in a way. Huh? If you look at the, the scale of things, the regularity and so on, they have all kinds of fascinating properties. They are 3D. And this is already existing for millions of years already. And you can find those everywhere. Actually, if you would like, you go to the lake and then you scrap a bit the, the rocks there, you will find some of these diatomates. They are everywhere. Okay, it's, it's, those are amazing things. So, well, certainly not the point to say we should necessarily imitate what nature is doing, but certainly it should challenge us in asking ourselves, are we maybe doing the right thing? Or maybe uh, are, we, are there al alternative approaches that would be uh, more efficient, maybe? Okay, so one of the questions uh, maybe to ask is, uh, can a material be more than just a material? So meaning by that, just a component. Okay, so this is an old dream, right? So, so this has fed the, the imaginary for centuries, starting from the Greek, um, and probably earlier as well. So this is a famous legend of Pygmat Pygmalion and Galatea, uh, where the sculptor Pygmalion was, uh, in a way, uh, falling in love of his own sculpture that turns alive and so on. And then you have variations of that. For instance, this is in the Jewish uh, uh, mytholo uh, mythology, which is the Golem myth. Okay, it's very famous from uh, uh, um, Prague, where the, the idea was that the rabbi, a rabbi would uh, form this creature here out of clay that he would mold, and then uh, turn it alive by writing some magic words on it and so on. So it's, it's the idea of turning a material into something fantastic and so, so natural and so on. But of course, you can also think of the alchemist, you know, and this was maybe a bit more greedy, okay, more driven by greediness, which was thinking of how to turn lead into, uh, into gold, you know, uh, these kind of things. But okay, but th those are some uh, uh, dreams, of course. Now, but if we think a bit about uh, material, so there's an important concept, which is the concept of polymorph. So that means that certainly materials, uh, what, what is important are the constituents of the materials, but of course, how they are arranged. And uh, a very uh, um, simple example to, uh, to uh, realize is just to consider diamond. Okay, if you look, diamonds uh, can have a lot of uh, allotropic forms, like this one, huh? or it can be in the form of graphite, and you see immediately this has radically different uh, properties. So one is very optically transparent, the other one is not at all. And uh, uh, on top of that, for instance, you can look at a lot of different properties. If you just look at the mechanical properties, for instance, the young modulus of diamond is, is a huge, 12,000 gigapascal. Of graphite, it's just a, a few gigapascal. So it just shows you that just the way uh, molecules uh, and atoms sorry, are arranged inside the, the materials will, of course, totally change its properties. So now it's, uh, here's maybe a, a proposal is, uh, uh, could we think of starting from a block of materials and then uh, start by locally turning the structure of the materials, uh, adjusting it so that maybe we turn it into some more than just what it was before, and, but putting into that the concept of system. So here's an important thing is that uh, the idea is not to make another materials, but to, in a way, modify it so that it does a specific functions for what it is designed for, okay? So really, the, uh, the idea of the system. Now let me put that uh, in, uh, show you a few illustrative examples maybe so that it's a bit more clear. Um, so imagine you have, uh, for instance, this, is, this can be in any optical labs like ours or anywhere, uh, where you, you put a bun bunch of optics, you make an experiment, you demonstrate some physical phenomena, then the, the, the next step you try to do is maybe to miniaturize that, to integrate it. It's actually a beautiful project that was in uh, the group of Professor Clavel, that, uh, where they, they try to, in a way, integrate, uh, and very successfully actually, uh, an optical bunch on, on, a, on a chip. Here it was a sapphire, a substrate. Okay, so you can imagine you can do that by precisely aligning these components so that it does the same than what was on the optical breadboard. Well, maybe the next step would be to direct write the functions, the optical functions we'd like to do. So maybe starting from a, a block of glass, and now I would direct write some, what you see here are waveguides, you know, that are combined and splitted and so on. So you can now do some optical functions like beam splitting, like exchanging energy and so on. And in a way, uh, maybe uh, perform similar functions than this one. 
Now you can also look at the same from a, a, a material science point of view. Now I start from a, a gripper, it's a, a, a VO, like industrial gripper size, okay? So you can miniaturize that. Think of doing it with, uh, uh, for instance, MEMS process. Or you could go one step further, is that just use one piece of metal, here is a Chapman alloy, and then uh, that taken alone would not be a gripper, but now if you locally modify the material so that this is now crystalline and this is not, then you, you have a fully functional device just in one, one block. So here's the concept. Now, of course, this is nice, but um, a key question is how, do, how to transform matter. Um, what kind of tools can we use? And can we just write a system? So the three poses is the question, how can we interact with the material? Now, the a key phenomena we use for all our studies is what's called nonlinear absorption. And uh, uh, let me briefly explain what this concept is. If I pass some light of a laser like this one, for instance, through transparent materials, well, nothing will happen. It would just uh, pass through and that's it. But now, um, <clears throat> if that intensity here is locally high enough, then I may trigger what is called nonlinear absorption, nonlinear effects. And suddenly, it's like if the material is no longer uh, able to respond in a linear way and, and suddenly start to absorb everything. But this will only happen where the, the energy density is the highest. So that means where you are at the focal point, for instance, when you focus the light tightly. Now, the, this is nice because that would give you the possibility to uh, modify the materials anywhere in a volume, which sounds impossible a priori. So now you can work in three dimensions. <coughs> but there's a catch is that uh, to do that, then you, reach to, you need to reach uh, instant power of 100 gigawatts typically per millimeter square, which is enormous, of course. It's much more than, than nuclear plant and so on. But this is instant power, so that's not continuous power. So now the, the, the trick to get into that regime is to use ultra-short pulses. So let me maybe a bit explain that. How short is a femtosecond? So, Always difficult to, to grasp how short is it, but one way to look at it is to think on uh, how much time takes light to propagate, for instance, from Earth to Moon. For instance, it takes roughly a second, a little more, okay? Now, if I think on how much time will it travel in uh, 100 femtoseconds, then, well, not much, it's just across your hair, typically. So that gives you an idea on how, how brief are those, those events. Now, okay, let's consider we take these pulses. So you see 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So nothing, okay, it's the last nothing. Now I, I take pulses that have in there 100, 200 nanojoules, so also nothing in a way, okay. If you would like to compare, you know, with the light bulb, it's really peanuts. So I take peanuts confined in an <laughs> extremely short time. But of course, now if I look at the instant power and if I focus that on a small surface, then I reach this uh, enormous uh, uh, peak power. Of course, only locally and only during the time of the pulse. So for during only a brief moment. But yet, if I would measure the average power, I'm still using nothing, 300 milliwatt. I mean, it's really peanuts. Just think, uh, of course, now we are changing of light bulbs, so they are not as uh, consuming as much as they used to be. But if you would consider a normal light bulb, like 50 watts, it's, you know, it's very quickly spent. While here, it's only 300 milliwatts. So it's like a, a bright LED in a way. So those systems, for instance, this kind of laser can be tabletop and can be small. So it's a kind of a paradox is that you think of this uh, small system capable of reaching this high peak power. Okay, now maybe to visualize better what uh, uh, nonlinear absorption means here, what you see is on top what would happen in a case of a continuous absorption. So if I shine light, for instance, on this liquid here, which is filled with uh, some fluorescent particle, then I would see some, uh, gradually, the light being depleted and absorbed and until it disappears, okay? Now, in the case of nonlinear absorption, what happens is that, you see, only something happens at the place where the light's focused, and only there, no, nowhere else, okay? So that's this nonlinear effect. Before, it's just transparent, and after, no, same thing. There's not enough energy for something nonlinear to happen, okay? Now, the, the beauty of this effect is that that works on everything that is transparent, basically. So that would work on polymers, on crystal, diamonds, sapphire, ruby, whatever, and glass, of course. 
Okay. Now, let me talk a little bit of glass, and I, I will open a parenthesis here, because there is a, a recurring, uh, um, let's say, I would call it urban legend about glass, but glass flow. Okay. You probably have heard about that. So we say the glass in cathedral is flowing, and uh, it's very funny because it's very uh, vivid, okay? And it keeps on coming back and forth and, and so on. So here you see the beautiful uh, 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 glass from cathedral, the cathedral of Chartres, okay? That's around 12, 12 uh, around the, 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 the 11th and 12th century. Um, now, where this comes, this legend comes from, is that people are saying, well, but when you look here, Mostly, you see the glass thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom, so it must flow. Okay, that was the, a bit as to a, a silly made conclusion. Now, when you look at the physics of that, is that possible? Okay, so you start by looking. So the way to model uh, 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 the viscosity in glass is this kind of flow. Okay, so it kind of. Uh, logarithmic law, okay, but you can fit for any glass, and then you couple that with a viscoelastic model. And when you do the calculations, even if you have to assume that ultra high viscosity would still have a meaning physically, but okay, let's assume that. Then you find out that, uh, well, if you wait uh, 10 to the power 32 years, then it may flow, okay? So it's, of course, more than the edge of the universe, so, so obviously it doesn't work. And then now you could say, uh, oh, well, the other way around would be to hold your glass for four, at 400 degrees, okay, and you wait 800 years, then okay, that may work, okay. So obviously it doesn't work from the physics point of view. But you know, it's very vivid. And now, why, why is there this, uh, just to close that part, but why is there this, this sort of non uniform shape? In fact, it comes from the processing. <coughs> is that the way people were making glass at that time, and still uh, this is used, uh, is called a crown glass process, where maybe you have seen uh, uh, glass uh, 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 makers doing that. You know, you spin uh, this disc of glass, you make it, you know, increasing, and then using the, the, the uh, centrifugal force to pull the glass out and form that disc. And then what you do after is that they were cutting out of that pieces. But of course, this is not homogeneous in thickness. Okay, it's very hard to get a perfectly flat one. So the, the, in fact, what most, what's most likely the reason why the cathedral glass are like that is because when they were mounting it, they were always putting the thicker uh, edge on the bottom. It's just, just pure uh, logic, okay? Now, if you are even not convinced, without even thinking of the physics, you know, it's, it's amazing because glass is at the same time one of the materials we understand the least and at the same time, one of the materials we, we, we know about for really a long, long, long time. So we know that the Egyptians were already making glass devices, the Greeks were doing some. You see those are beautiful, not very, very old, but still, you know, from the Roman time, where they were remastering uh, glass making already, yeah, as you can see. And obviously this has no traces of flow whatsoever, and it's older than the cathedral itself. So the conclusion is that glass does not flow. But it's funny how this legend is keep on going. I keep on ask, having questions about that, which is uh, always uh, intriguing. And even when you go to Corning, uh, the Corning Museum you know, of Glass in, uh, in New York State, is actually you can go on their webpage, it's their webpage. It's very funny because you see on the, <laughs> the front page, or almost the first question you put, does glass flow? Because I'm sure they have been receiving tons of questions, yeah, we well, yeah, about glass flow and so on. <laughs> and, uh, and you see that's glass flow, and you see for, <laughs> they put immediately, no, it does not flow, and then see below for the explanation. <laughs> anyway, so I close that parenthesis and co go back to glass. So glass does not flow, so it's an interesting material for uh, uh, microsystems and uh, micromechanics. And um, now it's also a fascinating material because it has, uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, we call it amorphous, but it's in fact not really amorphous because there is a short range order. It's not that it's totally disorganized, but it's not, of course, the ordering is only on the short scale. Okay, so you can draw statistics on, for instance, for the silicon oxide about the size of the ring, how they would distribute in the material, so forming something like that. Okay, so now the question is what happens now if we expose our femtosegon laser on this structure? Well, it's very nice, in fact, because a lot, a lot of interesting things happen from the viewpoint of making uh, um, uh, microsystems and integrated devices. The first one is that you can increase the, locally the refractive index. So it's like if you were uh, capable of writing a fiber inside the volume of a glass. So that, that's very interesting. So you can see, for instance, here, this helicoidal uh, waveguide, you know, which, was, which was made in a block of glass. 
Now, the, the second interesting thing is that uh, whatever is exposed to the laser will be etched faster. So you get an increase of the etching rate in, for instance, HF or KOH, so that we can immediately think in terms of fabrications. And then there are other properties. I won't get into too much detail because this is more related to the optics properties, so form by refrangence, controllable, and eventually even creating voids like you create cavities in the materials. If you can't find energy enough, it's almost like if you were blowing it apart and creating a void in there. Uh, or even melting the materials if you concentrate a lot of uh, energy at a very high rate. Okay, so, but the, from the viewpoint of uh, uh, making things, uh, which is interesting is that uh, a laser is in a way capable of doing a multiple uh, different type of modifications, which all has some interesting features for uh, functional devices, and that's the same laser that does this. It's not that you change of laser to the one on the other. It's simply you play around with the parameters to do that. So now if we think about uh, our first topic is how to make things differently. Well, if, for instance, when you get this kind of homogeneous modification, that's very interesting if you make waveguides, so if you make integrated optics devices. Now, these fascinating things, and I would like to say a few word, more words about that, this nano grating, you see, this is the size of a laser beam uh, when it's focused. So, so you see, within the focus, you have this self-organized structure. And that's uh, some of the smallest things ever made with, uh, with a laser, okay? So it's beating the, the diffraction limit, of course, it's smaller. It's a few uh, tens of nanometers. And this self-organized within the electrical field of the laser. And this has a lot of interesting properties, not only for, ma for machine, but also for uh, optical properties, because here <coughs> you have, in a way, modulations of the refractive index. So that's useful if you want to make, uh, have some control by refrangents. Now, if I dump a lot of pulses very fast, I will get into a regime where I melt the glass, and that's uh, some interest, for instance, if you try to weld the glass together. Okay, now, how it works. So it does sound complicated, but in fact, it's quite simple. Uh, so we use uh, uh, femtosecond lasers that are actually tabletop. I will show you at the end a picture of the lab. You will have an idea on how big is that. And what we first do is that we expose the, the glass within the volume uh, to the laser uh, beam. And this is done without, uh, um, um, without ablation. So nothing is removed to the material. Okay? That's a very important point. We never remove anything. We just modify it. And uh, that means you can do that outside of cleanroom. In fact, that doesn't matter because you don't remove any materials, you don't produce particles, so that's, that really does not matter. And then if I want to make that uh, structure, and then I will uh, uh, do a chemical etching so that I remove whatever in the material that's been exposed and form like some uh, cavities or whatever I want. You know, for instance, you can make tunnels or things below the surface, which sounds a priori impossible. Okay. So I maybe I'll show you a small video uh, rapidly about uh, the, the system in operation. I mean, it's, again, very simple. You have a stage, okay? Y if you look carefully here, you see a little white dot. That's the plasma that is forming, okay? The laser is invisible to, the, to naked eyes, but at the place where something happened, where you have the interaction, you have a plasma that's created, and that emits uh, white light, okay? So, so that's why you see this white spot here. And now if I scan any kind of patterns, then I will form uh, whatever I'd like to do. So it's scalable, of course, you can make as big as you want as long as you scan your, your patterns. Okay, but as I mentioned before, this is a nonlinear process. So since it's a nonlinear process, that means that now I can think of doing 3D things, 3D parts. I'm just showing you this uh, uh, micro hinge here. Uh, where you see three bridges, one on top of another, they don't touch each other. And that's something uh, that was impossible to make with classical uh, lithography. You cannot do that. Okay? You need to have this nonlinear interaction to do this. And it's interesting because this kind of hinge, in fact, at the ma macro scale, so when they are made of strips of metals, you know, when they are assembled, uh, these kinds of hinges are, uh, uh, were quite common in precision engineering. Okay? But you could not downscale it. That was the, one of the issues. Now we can, so we can think of using those. They are interesting because they are, for instance, very stiff in torsion as well as being uh, good in, uh, in bending. And then you can think of complicated uh, uh, system. Like this is a, a linear guidance, okay? It's called a Hooken guidance. 
And uh, here we did it on purpose to show different things. First, that you can reach very high stress in such a structure. So this will move uh, along the line here, OK? But also to show one uh, key properties of glass is glass is uh, 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 an isotropic material. So if you look at the young modulus, it will be the same uh, in all directions. So compare, for instance, to silicon, silicon would not be the case. You would depend on which direction you're machining. But glass is not. It's an uh, isotropic material. OK, so you can go on and on and think of different things. For instance, these are micro molds make, uh, made in 3D. So it's like micro bottles. Each of these micro bottles is like 100 microns, so quite small. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can beat the diffraction limit. So the, the rule of thumb is that when you focus a laser, the diffraction limit makes it that you will not be able to focus it more than typically than about these wavelengths. But in fact, we already saw that you can make things that are smaller than the laser itself. It's not violating any physics law. It's simply because, that, again, that's this nonlinear effect. Okay? But particularly interesting is this idea that you can combine uh, different things like a wave guys with fluidic channels and put them together which is interesting when you think of doing a, a Francis optofluidic device. Okay. Um, I'd like to say uh, just a few words about microstructure, but I won't get in details. This would take uh, a, a lot of time, but just some brief, uh, brief things about it. So what is influencing the, the, the machining? Well, there are different things, like how, short, uh, 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 how much energy, of course, you have in your pulse, how fast are you pulsing your laser, uh, the polarizations of the laser beam. So it's, this is light, okay? So light, uh, yeah, uh, the polarization will depend on the orientations of the electrical field. And you can see here, depending on how the electrical field is oriented, and I get different type of morphologies. And as well as how much energy deposits in the materials or the pulse duration. Okay, so all these, these are knobs you can turn to uh, uh, adjust the type of machine you do. Of course, one of the problem is uh, how do you observe such thi small things? Because what we do at best is modifying micron mi uh, micron micrometer cube volume. So it's very tiny volume. And a big challenge for us is always to look at ways of, uh, you know, looking at the structure in the material. And one of them, for instance, this is just an example, is using IFM where you see the topology here of the glass. And at the same time, you look at the thermal conductivity, and you see here you don't see anything. So, you, the, but here you see that the laser has done something. In this particular case, it has changed the thermal conductivity locally. So it's revealing where the laser was. So something you don't see here. It's just showing you again that the material has been transformed, but not removed. The material is still there. Just it has change of structure. So the, our, our favorite tool, one of our favorite tools, is to use the Raman, so which was invented, and the principle was invented by Raman, in a, and he got the Nobel Prize for that in 1930. So what's the, bas the basic idea? I mean, every vib everything vibrates in, uh, in material, so the molecules vibrate, and so on, and so forth. Now, if you find a, a laser light on that, then you will have some scattering, and if you observe this particular scattering here, then you get a spectrum. And that is telling you something about uh, how the structure is in the material. Okay, so then you can uh, infer what kind of structure the material has. So we use that a lot to examine uh, what happened after the laser exposure. Here I'm showing you one important thing is that um, if you compare, for instance, one, one of the hypotheses was maybe we densify the glass and I would explain, explain, for instance, in the case of wave guides, why is it wave guiding? Now, uh, if you compare with what happens when you mechanically uh, densify a glass, when you do it by uh, pressing the glass together, then you observe some typical uh, informations on the pulse, you know, that gets narrower and shift and so on. The, the, sorry, the peaks. Now in laser, you get a different story and you see, for instance, these peaks going up. So without getting to details, but every of the peaks is telling you something about which type of structure you have formed. And, and here, in a way, it's telling us that in this uh, network of rings, you know, remember rings of different size, we have formed closer one uh, after the laser. Okay. But that was just to show you an example on how one can uh, uh, explore what the laser has done. Now, other technique we use now is to, uh, of course, use uh, some more advanced uh, uh, technique like TM and FIB. Now, you see here, again, this, uh, how these uh, uh, type of modifications are evolving as I'm increasing, for instance, the pulse energy. 
And very intriguing is the fact that you go from some kinds of continuous modification in the materials to suddenly this sort of self-organized patterns, which are these nanoplanes that are self-organized. And this is still not really understood, in fact, how these kind of things form. Okay, so we, we have a lot of, uh, in terms of uh, looking into alternative tools to explore this type of modification. I'm just showing you an example here, which are cantilever beams. But if you re expose to the laser beam after, now you can try to investigate how much this uh, volume has changed, how, how much it has expanded eventually, just by measuring how much your cantilever is moving. So if I expand a lot, then it will move down. If I shrink, it will move up. So they're telling us something about the volume changes due to the laser. And it's very intriguing, for instance, when you change the pulse energy, you see you go from uh, first you shrink the material and then it expands after. Very fascinating. And as I mentioned, this uh, nanostructure, again, uh, imagine the, this is one laser spot, so this is a micron, okay? This, the orientation of those planes depend on how the electrical field is, uh, you know, so the polarization of the laser beam. So now you can imagine if I write lines and I don't change the orientation of the electrostatic field, then I get, uh, in fact, uh, uh, my nanoplanes always are oriented the same like this. But what you see is that obviously this has a different effect on the materials and in particular in, into the different region, uh, into the, in between the lines. So that's indicating, for instance, that you put some stress in the materials that will depend a bit on the orientations of the nano gratings. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, which is fascinating, is when we did these experiments and we looked after what was the possible stress in there that we induced in the material. It's huge. It's like uh, several gigapascals, so that's huge. And you can play around, like for instance here, this is a, a, a homogeneous tube, okay? Then these images you see here are what is called photoelastic images. So you look at the stress inside the material, so how it developed, and you see that when you turn the, the, the electrostatic field polarization, then you change the, the uh, stress orientation. So it's really a way, in a way, you write different stress state, and that can be correlated to the nanostructure inside uh, the modified zones. Okay, and that's, for, is, that's finding applications, uh, uh, something we just submitted, for instance, in, into making wave plates, so wave plates are a very important tool in optics for controlling the polarization of light. So you could imagine if I pass my uh, a light beam into a wave plate, I will, I will turn its polarization field by a certain amount. So if you can control the amount of retardance, the amount of, of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of retardance you introduce, then you can tune what kind of polarization you could get. So this is an example where we fabricate inside a uh, monolithic of glass just by reusing the laser, putting this under stress, different level of retardance inside the structure. Okay, I pick another example just to show you. This is a very rich topic, so I could certainly talk for hours on that, but uh, I think we will all get thirsty if I do that. So let's uh, uh, maybe pick another illustration, which is uh, an example of self-organization processes taking place when you do the laser exposure. Um, as I mentioned, depending on uh, how far you, you fire, uh, sorry, how fast you fire the laser, you get different response. And that can be understood that, imagine this is my laser beam. Now this is the material response. If I gi give enough time for the materials to, you know, get back to a rest position in a way, then uh, that's, it doesn't matter how far my pulses are apart. Now if I put them very close one to another, I'm not giving any time to the materials to come to rest. So you have a cumulative effect. And that's typically above a megahertz when you fire very, very often the, the pulses. Now when you explore that, an interesting phenomenon occurs. So you re literally boil the glass. So you see here, we are writing lines and then you see some bubbles forming. But the interesting thing is when I keep on accelerating how fast I write, you know, eventually I get to a point where the structure self-organize and eventually get, becomes perfect. And the, the, the interesting thing is that this is uh, the periodicity of those structures is driven by the physics, not, not at all by the laser. I'm not stopping the laser, okay? So it's extremely irregular, okay? In particular, because in between uh, these bubbles, I have a lot of pulses, 6,000 pulses. So even if I have some noise in the system, this is in a way self-regulating. So it's a very interesting phenomena where you have the physics uh, that's driving the, the, the periodicity of the structure. And then you see here, we start from a chaotic regime, 
And then we keep on increasing the speed up to a point where it becomes highly organized and uh, perfectly irregular. So it's fascinating because you see, for instance, the, this sort of bubble with a, a, a satellite one. Now this is looking at uh, certain magnifications. Now I demagnify, I demagnify, I demagnify. You see, it's extremely irregular. Okay, and, and that's, uh, again, the laser was not stopped. It just keeps on writing continuously. But this forms uh, due to this uh, uh, oscillation in the system. Now, um, I'll stop that with about, about my core structure, but just finish up with some uh, uh, examples of how can we use that in microsystem and multifunctional integrations, basically. So as I mentioned, you can have uh, fluidic channels and then waveguides, and then if you combine them, then you form some optofluidic device. Now, why is this, this nice? Because this is made in, a, um, in one sequence. You do everything at one time. You don't uh, use one system to make the waveguide, another one to make the fluidic channel. You make everything in one go. Now, when I compare the waveguides with some, uh, uh, if, so if I combine the waveguide with some mechanical element, like a flexure, now we'll create some optomechanical device, so where I can do interesting things. Now, I'd like to show you this video, because again, this is going back a bit to this uh, cathedral, uh, glass from cathedral. When we talk about doing mechanics with glass, it scares people most of the time. Because we have this intuition that glass is not a good material for mechanics. But it's, in fact, it's a wrong intuition. It's, it's actually wrong. It's one of the strongest materials. And in fact, it's, nobody has never really measured the elastic limit of glass. Okay, so because it's, in fact, it's driven by the surface effect. So what dr drives the ultimate li limit when it will break is, is mostly the surface. So if I have some defects, then it will break instantly. But here, don't, let's not forget, first of all, the laser is very confined. So the modifications are extremely localized. The second aspect is that we do a chemical etching. So in a way, we clean up the surface for any defects that might be there. So, so that's the reason why you get very easily uh, up to 2 gigapascal or even more stress in the material. So it's more than steel, OK? It's way more. And uh, a big difference with, uh, sili uh, with silicon, for instance, is that, again, this is an isotropic material. So it doesn't matter in which direction I'm looking. It will have the same properties. Okay. So glass does not flow. Huh? So, so we can do that, repeat that many times, and so on. Okay. Now, eventually, you can break it okay, if you push it hard enough. But I just would like to show you something interesting. Because there's another thing we know for sure is we say glass has a, what is called a brittle fracture break glass it falls into many parts. But in fact, when you look at, uh, you know, so this is a broken hinge, exactly the same one you have seen before. And now we do look in the SEM and we look at different things. So for the fracture mechanics people, you have some different uh, uh, recon recognizable uh, uh, patterns on that that you can attribute to certain effect. But interesting, when you magnify and magnify and look at certain parts of the, the fracture, you find this kind of spaghettis and uh, things like that, which shows that the glass has, has uh, turned into a plastic deformations. So uh, that's an interesting thing, is that glass at the nanoscale, in fact, deforms plastically, <coughs> not anymore uh, really uh, a brittle fracture. And uh, that's, there are things that, were, uh, that has been observed before, like you see very early on, actually. But if you do a certain case, some scratching, you've, you've observed some kind of flakes. And it's a, a topic that is quite well studied. Uh, tr people try to understand uh, why is it, uh, how is uh, glass breaking at a, a nanoscale. So just to point out that there's a lot that we don't know, in fact, and that's still worth uh, uh, exploring more. OK, now what can we do? So if I combine these waveguides, you see, with some uh, mechanical guidance, now I can make uh, a fully integrated device where I have a, 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 um, a guidance in which I have some uh, waveguide that gives me a, an information on the position of the device. Let me show you this guidance. So this is glass again. Um, and then you see when I press on it. So the gap here in between is 15 microns. So that's about uh, one fourth of a hair, typically. So it's, it's obviously a good guidance. Um, and now. Well, glass is transparent, so why not? You can make transparent actuator. To be honest, we don't know to, to do what yet, but uh, it's, it's fun. <laughs> um, and then uh, other things, and this is uh, the thesis of Tao Young, for instance. This is, uh, uh, let's not forget, this is 3D machining. So now we can start exploring uh, also other ways of actuating device. For instance, if you, you know that if I have a capacitor, 
and I put a dielectric in between. If the field is uniform, well, for the dielectric, although I will have uh, some dipole forming, it will not move because it's, it's symmetric. Now, if I put now this in 3D, so if I put a, an angle between those electrodes, I will create a field uh, gradient, so the, the field is no longer uniform. And now, although this does not have any charge, free charges on it, uh, it's purely a dielectric, then I, I can make it move. And this is this called the electrophoresis effect, that's a second order effect, so you need to have a gradient of electrostatic field, and that depends on the square of it, so that doesn't matter if we, I switch signs for, from electrodes, for instance. And then furthermore, that can be positive or negative, because this will depend on these parameters, which depends on the material itself. Okay, but just to show you an illustration that, because we can do 3D device, then now we can also explore how to make things we could not test before, and like this kind of things. Now you can also think of instruments, um, just showing here. Uh, one of the, the things we are studying is, as Christos actually was filming in the back, who is doing these kind of things, is uh, uh, we study uh, the mechanics of glass. So the problem is if you want to study the mechanics of glass at micro scale, is well, if you make a test specimen, you mount it in a classical uh, uh, apparatus, you will break everything before you even have mounted it. So we have to make some integrated device to be able to load a specimen and to observe how much it's moving. So for instance, here you see that that uh, test beam is uh, eight microns, and it's about uh, uh, a bit more than 40 microns uh, in, that, in the lens. Okay, very, very small. And then we loaded it, for instance, here to 2.4 gigapascal. So it's just to observe how is it reacting, okay? So this is a real image, huh? just looking at the stress in there, okay? Now, can we uh, also think of, could we go towards perfect shape? What, what do I mean by perfect shapes? Is that, suppose that I'd like to make a sphere now that has the absolute perfection in terms of uh, roughness, being like an optical uh, quality and so on and perfect roughness. Now, if I try uh, uh, to do that just by machining my sphere, I'm, I'm very unlikely to succeed um, because I will rely a lot on the precision of the stages and whatever I'm using to do that. Now, here's a trick. Suppose I start from a cube and now I, uh, I fire another laser. Here's a CO2 laser and I melt the glass now, okay? So I force it to melt. Now it's behaving a bit like a liquid in a way. If I go high enough, of course I have to go to 2,000 degrees. Uh, then it will, like a drop of, of liquid, it will in a way by surface tension converge to the perfect sphere because this is the minimum energy for the system, okay, when, we, when it's driven by the, the surface tension. And then, uh, of course, it's perfect because now what is driving the, the, the shape is the physics and not the whatever system I'm using to doing that. Okay, and then, uh, and you can already see that this has nice optical properties because you see the light is a bit trapped in there and you see this halo of light around. So you can imagine this is particularly interesting for resonators. Here you see again, you see the, the first shape to start with is not bad, huh, actually. If you look at the roughness here, it's comparable to uh, already to EDM, for instance. But it's of course not perfect. Now if I fire the laser on that, this will turn into a perfect sphere and you see these uh, evolutions here. Okay, now what's, I've shown you just a few examples, but there are many things we could talk about, but let's maybe say a few words uh, about the future and some of the directions we are uh, exploring. One of it is uh, high pressure studies with lasers. Um, the, when we study high pressure materials, the typical tools that I use is to use two diamond uh, 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 component that you, you, you press together, uh, in, in, the, in between you press uh, uh, given materials, you'd like to try, test under very high stress, very high uh, force, okay, very high pressure. And then after that, you eventually analyze that volume. And that volume is extremely small, okay? So this works fine, but of course, you are testing uh, extremely small volumes of materials. So it's interesting for the fundamental studies, but you cannot do much with that. Now, the, uh, imagine that uh, maybe we could mimic some of this with a laser. Now, what would that be interesting? It's because we know that at high pressure, there are certain phase, for instance, in the case of silicate that forms, and that have been found in nature. For instance, some of it are stichovite, which is a very known phase. It's one of the hardest phase on Earth, but it has been found only in certain area in, on Earth, for instance, in, uh, in meteorite craters, because the shock was so violent that it created the conditions where the materials could form. 
And for instance, this material, stichovite, has a density which is twice more than the initial glass. Okay, it's like 4,000, it's uh, incredible. Okay, so now the question is, can we maybe recreate such conditions by uh, firing the laser on the glass and exploring in this very high pressure wave how much of the material is modifying. So this is a collaboration with the uh, lab of uh, Philippe Gillet, Earth and Planetary Science Lab. And uh, I won't get into details, but just here you see, for instance, those are experiments that Alexandros is doing, looking at uh, shockwave propagations. So yeah, imagine we, we send the laser beam, and the laser beam <coughs> stays for a very, very short time. And because you deposit uh, so much energy in such a sh short time, then you create, you launch this shockwave you know, from the side. So these, you have this wave that is propagating. Here it's more the acoustic wave that you see, the acoustic emissions. So this is done by doing a pump probe experiments where you use another laser to probe dynamically how the acoustic wave is propagating. And what we try to do is to explore now, if I make, imagine I have like an emitter of, of stress and, and shock wave. Now I can make this shock wave like, uh, like a normal wave colliding, uh, superposing eventually, and maybe reach in the middle higher stress enough to get into new phases. So we are testing these ideas, and this is a phase diagram of silica, where you can imagine that depending on which path you, you choose from the melt to the, and controlling the pressure, you might form interesting phase of the materials, but we don't really know, in fact, in terms of uh, technological applications. Just an example of some first results with uh, our co colleagues at Earth and Planet Science, where you see here some materials that have been formed, not exactly this way, another way. But you see, uh, this is, for instance, so showing a uh, uh, Raman spectra that, for now, we, we cannot really correlate to an existing one. So it's another material, in a way. Okay. So there's a lot to be done in that field. Okay. And I mentioned this is the lab. I would have loved to take you there. So you're, of course, welcome to come anytime you would like. Uh, you see the laser are just here. Okay, it looks a bit messy, okay, but the laser source are here. There are uh, actually three of them here. So it's quite small. And then we place the specimen on stages like, uh, for instance, station like here, and we observe what's happening when we expose to the laser. Okay. Well, <clears throat> with that, I will finish the, let's say, the scientific part. Uh, what you see here, by the way, it's just uh, funny illustrations, is uh, some algae. So okay, it's a collaboration with uh, Peter Kazansky at the uh, University of Southampton. Those are algae that are uh, trapped into uh, a, a vortex beam. So a vortex beam is uh, creating is like. Uh, uh, a spiral uh, uh, force field. So they turn in circle, you know, they are trapped in there, like, uh, and, and they want to stay in circle, you know, and they rotate. It's just uh, a bit funny, just to manipulate uh, cells. Okay, so maybe uh, b before uh, I move to some uh, more, f oh, sorry, a bit uh, less formal part, I'd like to uh, maybe take some questions, if you have some. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> no questions. Where is the apparel? No. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> okay. So maybe uh, um, I, I move to the to some uh, special thanks I'd like to make because we you know we don't have that opportunity so often. So I'd like to to uh, actually uh, in particular warmly thank uh, Professor Raymond Clavel, which is right here. So it's a great honor to have him here. So everybody knows Professor Clavel. He's an icon, I would say, in TPFL for, in particular, the invention of the Delta, but many other things. So, I mean, I was very thankful of uh, first uh, coming. In fact, I came as, a, as a Professor Clavel. Maybe, peut-être, je vais passer en français pour cette partie. Uh, uh, Comme disait le Professor Clavel, quand je suis arrivé à l'EPFL, je venais pour l'aide aux pays en voie de développement. <rire> en fait, j'étais venu sous un... J'étais militaire de ce temps-là, et on pouvait faire son service militaire euh, à l'EPFL. Donc j'étais pour l'aide aux pays en voie de développement, comme disait avec beaucoup d'humour euh, professeur Clavel. Euh, et puis après, c'était bien passé, donc on a continué son thèse. Donc j'aimerais beaucoup le remercier pour ça, d'avoir donné cette opportunité. Euh, après, malheureusement, Jacques Eric n'a pas pu venir, il m'a envoyé un mail récemment, mais euh, euh, il, il s'excuse bien. Mais euh, Jacques Eric Bidot a aussi joué un rôle important durant ma thèse. Donc, il était, je travaillais déjà beaucoup dans des domaines très multidisciplinaires qui étaient à cheval entre la science des matériaux et le, la microtechnique, hein, parce que c'était d'étudier les, les matériaux en mémoire de forme. 
Et puis j'acquérais qui était l'interface euh, euh, du côté matériaux, donc j'ai beaucoup interagi avec lui. Euh, et puis peut-être un souvenir de Rolf Gotthard, euh, qui malheureusement est décédé, euh, qui il y a quelques années, et qui lui aussi a joué un rôle important. Lui était l'interface côté physique, il était l'Institut de génie atomique. Alors là, peut-être vous connaissez, ce sont des, des sculptures d'Étienne Kraumbühl, qui, est un grand, qui était un grand ami de, de Rolf Gotthard. Et ces sculptures euh, sont faites, alors celles-ci euh, sont faites avec des, des, des matériaux noirs de forme, donc ça bouge, c'est des sculptures hein, en quelque sorte actives. Hein. Euh, et puis Max, euh, Max Olivier, <rire> anglais, donc j'ai toujours interagi avec lui. Puis, bon, les gens qui connaissent Max, ils savent que c'est quelqu'un de très modeste. Donc c'est comme, comme je suis toujours très mal organisé et que je fais les choses à la dernière minute, je cherchais une photo rapidement de Max, mais on ne trouve pas sur Google parce que comme il est modeste, euh, voilà. <rire> mais alors j'ai pris celle-là parce qu'en euh, en fait on travaille beaucoup ensemble avec beaucoup de plaisir. Parce que c'est alors Max a une formation de, de, de physicien théo, euh, théorique et euh, euh, en fait comme je vous ai dit il y a des tas d'effets très intéressants qui se produisent dans la matière et des choses euh, même si peut-être pas l'application directe mais qui sont tout à fait fascinantes d'un point de vue plus euh, scientifique et là par exemple il y a ces phénomènes d'intermittence qu'on est en, sommes en train d'explorer actuellement où on voit que le laser passe d'état organisé à état, des états chaotiques etc etc donc j'ai beaucoup de plaisir à interagir avec Max depuis des années, de, euh, depuis le temps du pavillon jaune, qui est maintenant été euh, englouti sous le Rolex Center. <rire> uh, special thanks well, to Philippe Bado, uh, qui a joué un rôle, c'est lui qui m'a introduit au laser femtoseconde, et tout à fait par hasard en fait aux états unis uh, Donc uh, c'est bien qu'on filme, parce qu'il uh, ne pouvait pas venir, mais il a une bonne excuse, hein, il habite à Ann Arbor, au Michigan. Euh, donc, euh, et Philippe Bado, en fait, euh, donc j'ai tout à fait par hasard aux US, et en fait il est suisse et il vient de Lausanne, mais il a, il a, ça fait maintenant des années et des années qu'il habite aux états unis Et euh, c'est grâce à lui en fait, que j'ai eu une chance de rentrer un peu dans ce domaine euh, des la, de laser femtoseconde qui est absolument fascinant. Et puis alors il y a plein de gens euh, que je pourrais remercier, qui sont des, 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 des trois de collaboration, des amis hein, avec qui je travaille très souvent. Euh, John Wen, RPI, Ben Potts et Thor Labs. Uh, Jos Vlasak, Harvard, Jess Squire, uh, Ya Chang uh, in China, Shigeki Matsuo in Japan, and Yab Dentonder, uh, en fait, il viendra demain d'ailleurs. Uh, et puis j'aimerais remercier uh, uh, tous des anciens collaborateurs. So maybe I do that in English because they, uh, most of them don't speak French. So Shibara Jess, Frédéric Madani Grasset, Marco Matteucci, Yuri Van der Burt, Audrey Champion, Alison Srapp, Eric. Le staff and colleagues of Neuchâtel, well, uh, ça c'est un super endroit pour travailler, hein. on, est, on est un peu en retrait, mais en fait c'est bien parce que c'est très, très évidemment, comme c'est plus petit, ben, il y a un côté plus familial, donc on interagit beaucoup plus, donc de ce point de vue là, c'est vraiment une ambiance très agréable, et je dois dire j'ai été accueilli les bras ouverts, euh, on a même pu démarrer sur les chapeaux de roue, mais ça c'est grâce à l'efficacité et puis la, disons, la, la flexibilité d'avoir de, des petites structures, donc c'est absolument fantastique. Puis bien sûr, euh, voilà, hein, on travaille en équipe, donc voilà toute l'équipe actuelle, hein, donc euh, euh, David, euh, Alessandro qui est là, voilà, ils sont dans le fond, euh, et puis après vous avez euh, Christos qui est à la caméra là-bas, qui est gentil, il est en train de filmer. <rire> So, yeah, I should switch in English for now for, so Christos is here, Tao, uh, Jakub is here, they are all here, so you'll have a chance to talk to them. And then uh, the postdoc, so Ben, Ben's over there, and uh, Alexandros is in the back, and uh, Erika, I've not seen her, but, and then Josiane, who has a lot of pain uh, recently, unfortunately, but now is getting better, so he's uh, really the link in the group, okay. And of course, Marie-France et Loïs, ma femme et puis ma fille. Donc, ils me supportent tous les jours. J'ai déjà du mal à me supporter, alors vous voyez. Donc ça, c'est une, une diatomée, vous voyez, alors on peut être créatif. Hein. Alors, plutôt que d'aller chercher des Pokémon, ça vaut le coup d'aller chercher des diatomées sur les rochers. Vous allez en trouver des chouettes. Je ne crois pas qu'il y ait une app hein, pour chercher des diatomées, mais ça va peut-être venir. Et puis vous voyez, alors certaines, elles ont vraiment des formes fantastiques. Hein. C'est une vraie, ce n'est pas une fausse. Ça, c'est à peu près 100 microns. Vous voyez, avec des structures du, du, de l'échelle nano. Hein. Et alors là, c'est une image qui a été coloriée, OK Parce que c'est une image SIM qui a été coloriée en rose. OK, elle n'était pas rose à la base. Mais le reste est correct. <rire> 
OK, see you in 20 years. <laughs> well, I don't know, actually. That will depend on the, probably uh, the retirement age. So, and that might get longer, right? I think there are some votations coming up <laughs> about that. So thank you all. <clears throat>